hospital porters pride and dignity stop the new world order welcome to Hapanwo TV I hope you're all well and you're uh, not to yourself a coughing your guts up in bed like I was um, if you get it don't worry you know, it's not the end of the world um, so I'm back yes I know I made a video yesterday I'm making another one now and that's because well I'm sitting here short of money and not much to do you know, oh god I really want to get back to work yeah, I don't often say that, but I do. I want to get back to work. Oh, yeah, so um, what I've done is, to pass the time, of course, is I have watched episode four of Project of Blue Book, season two, and it's called Hopkinsville. Now, like all the Project Blue Book um, programs, this one is based on a true story. One moment. Oh, I just forgot my dragon juice. Must have that. It's based upon a true story, on a real UFO event. This particular event happened um, at a place called Kelly. Now, uh, Kelly is near, very near, close to Hopkinsville. In fact, um, this is sometimes called the, he the Kelly Hopkinsville incident. Now, if you want to know where, uh, where it's a bit like a Bill Hicks joke, isn't it? Where's Kelly? Man? Oh, it's somewhere outside Hopkinsville. <laughs> In fact. Um, the whole scenario is very like a, a bit of a Bill Hicks joke, you know, about uh, hillbillies and hicks and things like that and rednecks. It's all redneck heartland, you know. Um, it, it's almost, um, the place is actually almost a self-parody, which has not helped matters because, of course, the, um, I suppose the witnesses and the culture they live in fit in with the kind of, um, kind of, uh, sort of white trash, banjo playing, you know, moonshine drinking kind of p people. You know what I mean, and that's maybe that's unfair. You know, it's unfair that, that was, but that happens to be who they were. Now, this is in Kentucky, <coughs> in a rural community, and um, it happened on August the 21st and August the 22nd of 1955. Uh, basically, an entire well, there was two families of people. Like a, there was about there were seven adults and um, eleven children, I believe. I think quite a large number of people just turned up at the police station in Hopkinsville, this large town, they, dr they drove down from Kelly. Kelly's a tiny place, in fact, if you want to find it, you have to go north on the main road out of Hopkinsville, if you want to find it on Google Earth, or if you, if you happen to be there. But uh, I had to use the search function, it's, it's a tiny little hamlet, or it's got a church, or it's a village, I suppose. But it's a minute little place in rural Kentucky, USA. And they, they, this family turned up at the police station, terrified out of their wits, and they told an incredible story. The story they told, as I say, this is not in the TV series, this is real life, this actually happened, was that they'd seen a, a flying saucer land near their home, in a, which is in the wooded glade in Kelly, a little farmhouse, and um, a few minutes later, dozens, and they, they described them as dozens, of aliens start approaching their house. Um, <coughs> these people barricade themselves into the house and got their guns because of course they do have guns didn't they naturally and um, as these creatures started approaching the house they, they started shooting at them now uh, they actually they actually managed to do um, successfully target a couple of these creatures uh, but one of the creatures one of the witnesses reported that when he shot this creature at a point-blank range the creature appeared unharmed by the by the bullet However, he, it, the noise it made, it's made, sounded metallic. It was rather like he said he'd shot a metal bucket. That's the noise it made. But the creature appeared to be unharmed. At one point, one of the creatures is like, um, it's like, like climbing up the walls of the house, and he brushes a man's hair with his hand. It's, it terrifies him. Um, they, when they were in the house, um, these creatures start peeking in through the windows, and the the, the, the residents start shooting them through the windows, <coughs> and they. The, the police report says that these people honestly were scared. The, the, the police officers who, in, who interviewed, despite the weirdness of the story, believed them because, uh, as policemen, you know, they, they, I'm sure they're used to people spinning yarns, and they said these people sounded looked really scared. And um, the police went to investigate. The people that refused to return home straight away. Um, the, the police went to investigate. They found no signs of any aliens, but they did see the signs of a gunfight, um, bullet holes in the window, things like that. Um, this has been dismissed by skeptics as oh, that the, the people saw owls. 
<laughs> they saw owls. Apparently they're quite large owls living in the woods and this was these owls which actually spooked them. Apparently they were drinking heavily that night as well. Um, things like that but it, it seems it's there's lots of others who dispute that and I think it, it does seem a bit of a long shot that these people were simple, did what they did because they saw owls um, and, and again it's, it's, it's a bit like the uh, this is a bit of a lighthouse story I think the owls it's the it's the typical skeptic um, we we'll come up with anything we can think of because it's non ET it wins by default it's one of those sort of things so anyway, um, this this uh, episode is based around that, this episode of Project Blue Book, and um, it will contain spoilers, just to let you know, so it's best to go and watch the episode first before you watch my review, but when you have, I think you'll find my review interesting. The um, this There's a bit of a story arc here, and uh, there's some major developments in this story arc which covers the, the season beyond the different episodes, and this is of course Susie and her, her handling of um, Mike Quinn and it appears that the, the KGB the Soviet intelligence agency they want to capture Quinn and Susie is about to do that by injecting him with something which will obviously knock him out and um, they can capture him but um, it doesn't work out it doesn't work out he wakes up <coughs> but, um, obviously she's like uh, she is obviously his handler she's like she was for Mimi then, uh, the, the, then you see um, a bit of a development from the previous episode, which is this, <coughs> what you call the plan for alien invasion. <coughs> I still got a bit of a cough. Now it's interesting that um, Harding and Harding and Valentine, the generals Harding and Valentine, the heads of Project Blue Book, they have this, they have this plan, and they call it uh, a Pentacle Memorandum. Um, that's the, that's the name you see it on the top of the sheet. Now, pentacle, they call it pentacle. Pentacle is another word for a, a pentangle, or there's several other words for it, which is the five pointed star made by a continuous line, you know. The, the thing that is a pagan symbol, uh, a symbol of Wicca, and things like that. So it's an interesting they call it that. But of course, this is, tie, this is tying into what they said at the end of the previous episode, the, the Area 51 one, where they're talking about an alien invasion. There's a lot of development in this particular episode to that. So, um, you wonder what the hell's going on. Why, why they've got a memorandum named after a, a sort of like a magical symbol, which is all about alien invasion. Of course, it's interesting they choose that, because of course there is an, always an occult element to everything the government does. There is an occult, magical, black magical connection to things within the Illuminati which of course you often get within within the official government sources as well you know like uh, you may have seen um, you know the shock and awe um, catchphrase which was used by the Bush administration which of course is like a, it's like a mispronunciation of Shekinah which is a which is a Sumerian goddess and it's they called it shock and awe in Iraq and Shekinah is an ancient Iraqi goddess things like that I mean Ellis Taylor has talked a lot about this this sort of thing. Now uh, Heineck and Quinn travel to Kentucky to investigate this uh, particular UFO incident. I find, I find it very interesting actually because Quinn says something on the car journey down to Heineck which I find very interesting. He, he's, he, this has come up several times in the series especially the Roswell one which I've talked about before. But he says, hey, Doc, why, how, why do UFOs only crash in the woods? Why can't you never see one in Times Square? Again, it's this question, isn't it, that comes up. It's almost like the, uh, the producers of the program want us, ourselves, the viewer, to delve into this particular conundrum. And I should um, mention that, um, that this, this whole idea, it's, it's like, well, one thing I like about Project Blue Book is it doesn't, it does get the viewer thinking, it doesn't give you all the answers, it doesn't even, most of the, most of the episodes, the conclusion is not total. As it, and it would be boring if it was, I mean, this is what I try, I realised when I was writing the Roswell trilogy, that I couldn't just, I couldn't end it, even at the end of Roswell Revealed, uh, Roswell Redeemed, no, I'm sorry, Roswell Redeemed, I couldn't dot every I and cross every T. I had to give you, the, the reader, 
something to just think about after you'd finished reading it. This is this is why Steven Spielberg was so so adamant, was so incredibly adamant that he wanted to get rid of the scene for in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where you see inside the mothership. He was very very much against that. I mean, he was very reluctant to put that scene in, uh, which of course is in some of the. It was in the second cut, second director's cut, I think. But of course, you, the, the version I've got, um, I'm actually going to refer to Close Encounters in this particular review because I think it's very important. The version I've got, I actually watched it last night. Just, I, I, well, uh, my friend Lisa said, "Oh, I'm watch." She posted on Facebook, "I'm watching Close Encounters." And I thought, "I want to watch it as well," and I did. Um, yeah, I'm going to refer to that again in this program. But um, he didn't want anyone to see inside the mothership. That had to be left to the viewer's imagination. I had to leave things to the reader's imagination when I was writing the Roswell trilogy. And indeed you see this with Project Blue Book and it's very clever. And I think it's a very very wise thing. It shows maturity of the creators. It really really does. So this question has come up before. Why when UFOs crash it always is something like um, was it Bill Hex? <laughs> Five fucking Alabama, you know. Um, well, the answer the answer to that is basically, if you look at the population density chart of the entire world, you'll find the fact there's so many. There is an awful lot of us. I mean, what is there? Seven billion, eight billion? I don't know who counts us. One, two, three, four. You know, that must be difficult. But um, there are quite a large number of us. <laughs> put it that way. But um, as far as the Earth, the Earth is a big place. And it seems that uh, people are concentrated into a few small areas. In fact, the only areas of the Earth that are densely populated are um, large areas of Europe, where I live, um, the plains of China and India, and um, really that's it. Apart from a few spots, for example, in the in the Nile Valley in Egypt, uh, big cities in North America and South America, um, around the coast of Australia. Apart from that, the Earth is pretty much devoid of human life. Yeah, you wouldn't if you land aliens who land in, a, in in most areas of the world could spend a couple of weeks there looking around and they wouldn't even know we existed because those areas are uninhabited. Over, almost half the entire land surface of the Earth is almost entirely uninhabited. It's either too cold, too hot, too mountainous, or just unsuitable for other reasons. And of course, that's the land surface. It only covers about thirty percent of the Earth's surface. All the rest is sea. That is why UFOs tend to land in remote, uninhabited areas, because basically that is nearly the entire Earth's surface. Um, but uh, by the way, I've done an entire... By the way, this brings us into the overpopulation myth. Now, um, you may have seen my videos on the overpopulation myth. That's, that's, uh, watch those, because they're very important. Because you often hear, like, the Agenda 21 people saying, the world's overpopulated, we need, we need, to, we need to do something about it, we need government control, we need sterility pills, blah, 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 blah. we need forced abortion, blah, 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 things like that, okay? Um, male cow excrement. I've done vid entire videos about that, I won't repeat myself here. <laughs> but, um... Now, Quinn said, <laughs> if one, if, have you ever been to Times Square, Doc? And, he's, and Hynek says, yeah, sure I have. He says, if they ever landed there, they'd never get past 49th Street. Um, yes, they would. Um, if uh, an alien spacecraft did land in a highly populated area in the centre of the city, you have to ask yourself, could it be covered up? I know a lot of uh, sceptics will say, well, if they landed there, that would be it. The truth embargo would be over, wouldn't it? <laughs> That'll be it, guys. No more need for any. Uh, no more need for any cover-up because no other cover-up would be possible. No other cover-up would, 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 would ever function again. Hmm. Yeah, but would it? That's the question. Yeah, I actually think that it would. I think it's perfectly possible to cover up a UFO landing or crash. In a, in a major urban area. All you have to do is know a little bit about psychology and have the ability to control the media. And the government have both those things in abundance. Supposing you were walking through uh, Times Square, which is a place I've never been to incidentally, but um, so you know the kind of thing I mean. It's a very, very dense, very, very important crossroads in the middle of New York City, USA. Uh, you go walk through there and you suddenly see there's a flying saucer 
standing in the middle of the road and there's aliens walking around it. You think, oh my god, the aliens have landed! You go home and you say, hey, you'll never guess what I just saw in Times Square, guys. I just saw, <laughs> yeah, I just saw an alien landing and then the, just one moment, and then the, um, so I'm just, uh, as I said, I've got to just stop my uh, monitor going to screen save. It's all part of the lighting effect. Uh, and then uh, your, your wife turns to you and says, <coughs> no, no, it's, it's okay. I've just, it's been on the news that um, a bouncy castle was blew loose. It was at a fairground and it blew loose. And um, it landed in the middle of Times Square and some of the people came to get it and they were dressed as, um, they were dressed as aliens because they were like entertaining the kids at the party. And you go, oh, right. Maybe that is what I saw. Hmm. And so seeing it through the television, that source of authority, coming from the official media, which everyone believes, don't they? Plus, this this the herding instinct, this desire not to stand out from the crowd, which many most people have. Unless you have to deliberately work against that, actually, and which I have done, um, in order to actually resist it. Um, if you do that, um, if you have that feeling it's quite likely you'll go oh right that must have been what i saw it was just a bouncy castle and some people dressed as aliens even though that flies directly in the face of your own personal experience and your own memory most people will still conclude it so therefore i think it is perfectly possible to cover up the crash stroke landing of a ufo in times square in a, in a major urban area in fact i don't think that it's been done hypothetically I know it's been done because it has been done. Uh, what was what was Virginia? What was the Nottinghamshire case? I've covered these on this channel. What they these were things that happened in big cities in more major. In case of Nottinghamshire, it was in a major conurbation where large towns close by. In Virginia, as a city of a hundred thousand people, yeah, it has been done. So the answer, I mean, it's very interesting that it's, and I'm, I'm, I appreciate them bringing this up in the series Project Blue Book. I really, really do. It's really, really great that they've done this. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> now, um, the, the, what happens with Susie as part of the plot, there's this, uh, these two <coughs> various different plots going on. Susie herself is then kidnapped because she fails to kidnap Quinn. And um, I've heard about this within, within uh, spying, within, in, within foreign intelligence, that if you decide to be a spy and work for a foreign intelligence outfit in a certain country, I mean, it depends which country it is. I mean, I'll say more about this in, in some future videos I make about espionage, but um, if, you, uh, if you are working for, say in the Cold War, you will decide to work for the Soviet Union, and their intelligence agency and you're in the West you're in a lot you're in a lot much better position than someone in the Soviet Union or the Soviet bloc who decides to work for Western intelligence um, if you're caught in the West you tend you end up you may end up like George Blake uh, in jail from which he managed to escape or and um, then he fled to the Soviet Union and then, then he just went public and he he Basically, he became a uh, he became like a sort of celebrity. Then, you know, he'd uh, same with Kim Philby and the others, uh, the, the Cambridge spies. You know, they well, they turned up in the Soviet Union after their escape, and they would like hold press conferences in grand hotels and and talk to reporters from the Guardian and things like that. <laughs> um, if you were an intelligence agent for the Soviet Union in the West, or in the, you'd. Um, if you were actually working directly as an officer for the KGB, it was very different. Uh, or indeed, you were a Western agent undercover on, on a, as, a, as an agent in the Soviet Union. You, your life was at risk. If you were caught in the Soviet Union, you'd be tortured to give up information and then shot. <clears throat> if you're a KGB officer in the West, you would, have your, you would have your own supervisor who could kill you if they thought you were a threat. And this seems to be what happens to Susie. She's kidnapped by her handlers or her supervisors. And they, uh, they, they whack her over the head with a shovel and bury her in the woods. That's their plan, anyway. It goes wrong, but you find something interesting about Susie. She has a little picture of a little girl, and you realise it's her child. She has a daughter. 
and uh, that comes back later. Anyway, um, the uh, when Heineck and Quinn arrive in in Hopkinsville, the word the name Kelly doesn't come up in this particular series. They just kept it simple by making it Hopkinsville, which is a reasonably sized town near um, near Kelly, south of Kelly, which is where the police station was, where the people went in real life. Incidentally, if you're um, if you're into UFOs, you may one one thing on your bucket list, along with the Roswell, you know, the, the Roswell Festival and you know, visiting the gates of Area 51, is going to the Kelly Little Little Green Men Days. Now, this is something that's held every year on the anniversary of the incident. And if you go to Kelly today, there's like a UFO pageant there, you know. So you, it's worth going to that if you're in the area. Now, um, another thing that comes up is the idea of gremlins. Now, these the creatures that appeared at Kelly, this is like going back to real life now, they were sometimes described as gremlins, now, <clears throat> because they resemble gremlins. Now, gremlins, of course, is a very successful, uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek horror movie franchise, but it refers to something real, but it's not aliens. It refers to creatures that live in the sky. They live in clouds and things like that, allegedly, and um, they've been known to attack aircraft and sometimes mountaineers on high up in mountains. They've been known to descend from the clouds and attack aircraft. Sometimes they'll sabotage the aircraft, do damage to it. Sometimes they'll invade the aircraft and attack the pilots and passengers. Um, there's a very good um, uh, there's a very good episode of the Twilight Zone with William Shatner, who's the but went on to play Captain Kirk later on. He plays this man on a plane who um, actually is on a plane which is attacked by a gremlin. Um, now, the skeptics have put this down to hallucinations due to low breathing rarefied air because uh, the people basically, the mountaineers and pilots, are much too very, very high up and the air they're breathing is very thin, so basically their brain is starved of oxygen, which causes these hallucinations. And there's good reason for that um, uh, to think that, in fact, um, when aircraft were designed that had pressurised cabins, the gremlin phenomenon vanished. So there's good reason to think that. But I, I don't believe that um, the Kelly Hopkinsville's creatures were were actually... I don't believe they were actually gremlins. I think they, even though they look similar to descriptions. They're these little short creatures, like slightly slightly res reptilian, slightly insectoid, large eyes, big pointed ears like that. Um, interestingly, if you if you if your interest if you had an interest as a as as in UFOs as a small child, as I must have done, I don't remember it, but I must have done. Uh, because one of the reasons is because I read the Usborne book of UFOs. <coughs> and um, it's actually just been re reissued as an, in a new edition. It's worth reading. Um, one of the features of that book is they actually speculate on the Kelly Hopkinsville Goblin and what it actually might be like, what its, its spacecraft might be like and what its home planet might be like. Um, that's, so I'm, I'm, that's how I became familiar at a very young age with the Kelly Hopkinsville case. So then of course um, Heineck and Quinn go for their little stroll in the woods to investigate and they came, come across what looks like a green handprint and um, they think it might be alien blood and Heineck goes and looks at it and he says it's got a chemical like smell and of course a chemical like smell and Heineck of course gathers some on his handkerchief because and, and Quinn is going hey careful about that dark you might catch something you know is that safe and of course um, that's Quinn I think Quinn of course takes the ET hypothesis seriously because he, like Heineck, knows there's some re there are real aliens out there. And that is actually never questioned in the entire series, from the very, very first scene in the first episode. We are told there is a genuine ET phenomenon, that's never in any doubt. What is sometimes doubtful is whether certain cases might actually be aliens or not. Uh, now, now it gets very interesting because... Um, Mimi uh, is on the phone and Heineck calls her from a call box, no mobile phones in those days of course. And um, so, and she tells her, oh a guy called Daniel Banks called for you, and of course that made me think, blimey, of course that's Dan the CIA man, I told you he'd come back into it. <coughs> I mean that was this at the end, he appears in the last episode, he's the CIA guy at Area 51. And um, 
I, I said at the end that he says, well, you know, if you ever want any help get with this alien thing, just give me a call. And you get the feeling he's sort of on the he's on the pro disclosure side within the CIA. And I had a feeling he'd come back and he does. Um uh, there's a scene then where Quinn and um Heinick get they get pissed up on the local booze. Strong stuff they have in Kentucky, you know, they have their bourbon and stuff like that. And um they're reminiscing and Heinick saying how much he loves Mimi and um Quinn says, Oh, I really like Susie and then you think Susie's dead, but then <laughs> Susie wasn't actually killed, and I had a feeling she wouldn't be, because the, the guy who hits her with the shovel doesn't hit her very hard. And she falls into the pit, but you... I get the feeling she wasn't really dead, and indeed she's not, and she manages to escape from the grave. And, um... She, she kills the guy who tried to... to bury her, and steals his car. Um... And then Dan turns up. Dan actually turns up at the phone box where where Quinn is talking to Mimi and he says um, and he says I've just found out all about what's going on there's going to be an alien invasion it's going to be in Hopkinsville and again you've got this answer well, what, what sort of alien invasion because there's different kinds isn't there there's the alien invasions by aliens and there's the alien invasions not by aliens and then he's, then it gets very very interesting because he tells them he shows them a picture that was done by this person called Rebecca and she's psychic and she's part of MK Ultra. Blimey, <laughs> it's getting very exciting now isn't it? And he says that MK Ultra was part of this, um, the, this remote viewing thing. He says we know the Soviets are doing this so we're gonna do it as well. And you just, it's just a you get a taster, you just get a taster of what has turned out to be something very real. Indeed, there's been documentaries about this, and several people have spoken out about this, most notably Ingo Swan and um, Uri Geller. Now, of course, um, they've both written books about this. Now, Uri Geller actually, of course, is a big celebrity. He's like a pop magician type person. Uh, but, in fact, he is the, uh, I would describe him as the lesser of the witnesses. He's probably the least important witness in this particular um area of this particular area of um, study uh, far better is Ingo Swan far better he's much much more interesting he's written a very good book called what's it called revelations or something it's a very very good book anyway um, which I've read very very worth much worth reading where he does talk about I mean there's not a direct connection between MK Ultra MK Ultra is actually something different <coughs> it is mind control <coughs> with um, projects involving uh, the use of drugs, the use of propaganda, things like that. There's the Stanford Research Institute, the Tavistock Institute in Britain, these people are all involved in this, this sort of thing. Um, there was some, inf you know, the control of counterculture through figures like Timothy Leary, who unfortunately, um, there's distinct evidence that he was involved. He turned up at the reunion, and there's some video which was videoed and he's there now I know some people try to tie Terence McKenna in with this as well unsuccessfully I think it's um, it's a bit like I think these I can see through the disinfo posers doing this mostly but uh, with Timothy Leary there's distinct evidence I would say but in this in the particular series what you have is Dan talks about the CIA project called MK Ultra, which was real and then he takes them to the psychic lab he takes Heineck and Quinn to the psychic lab the laboratory where they're basically doing tests on people. Now, this is very interesting, although it's rather, rather unrealistic. Because Dan, even though Dan is one of the White Hats, he probably wouldn't be able to wangle that. I mean, it would be to get two guys from the US Air Force Project Blue Book and say, oh, come on in, man, look, right here. He just presses the combination on, beep, 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 on the door, and opens up and says, um, by the way, you know, just don't, don't tell anyone about this, and um, if you know, don't address the uh, don't address the precogs or what well, they call them the the psychics unless they address you personally. Things like that. It's unlikely. It's unlikely, but it's a very interesting plot device they put in here. But again, the there was MK Ultra. MK Ultra was real, and the remote viewing program in various guises was also real, involving Hal put off Russell Targ. You probably read you probably read about the uh, experiments done by Stanford that Geller and Swan and several other people were involved with. 
Um, don't believe the sceptic guy, what's his name? Not Joe Nicol. Um, there's a, there was a big sceptic involved as well. He's, 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 just, he's just there to muddy the waters. It'll, his name will come to me in a minute. But um, Ray Hyman, don't believe Ray Hy Hyman. He's full of excrement, honestly he is. Um, there's noise outside, I don't know what those people are doing. Anyway, um, it turns out that this um, this psychic, this psychic experiment, experimentee, this subject, this guinea pig, does like a psychic reading on Quinn, and she starts doing pictures. Just does these rough pencil sketches, and she makes it. I mean, Stan has already showed these guys the picture of the Hopkinsville alien that she does. Which may be why Dan wanted to talk to him about it, and that could explain why he would get them involved in the, the psychic lab thing. But um, it's uh, it seems strange. But then you see the, the the psychic then starts drawing pictures of flying saucers in the sky and soldiers with their rifles pointing up at the sky and things like that. And this ties in, imagine it, with this pentacle memorandum thing. And it's this alien invasion scenario as well. So, um, now, um, then, see, Heinick starts to sort of solve, so Heinick plays a sort of skeptic role in this, because he goes to a garage and he shows them the green alien blood to the mechanic, and the mechanic says, oh, that's just glaze, that's green glaze. Yeah, I've got a can of it here. And he says, you'll never guess came, who came through the other day and bought like 20 cans of this. This bloke at the circus. And um, the bloke at the circus is called Jimmy J. Shoemaker, who happens to be the real, the principal witness to the Hopkinsville aliens. Uh, it's, just, it's kind of a bit of a play on the name of the real witnesses. None, none of the names of the people in this particular series are the same, are the same as the ones in real life. Like they renamed Mac Brazel, they renamed Glenn Dennis in the Roswell double bill. In this case, the, uh, the actual real, the real guy who was the lead witness of the Kelly Hopkinsville case was a man called Billy Ray Taylor. And they've got this guy called Jimmy J. Shoemaker. So they're kind of like playing on his name. But it's, it's obviously meant to be him, but it's not the same guy. And so there we have a scenario where Heineck is now suspecting Jimmy J. Shoemaker of making the whole alien thing up. At the same time, we have this rather disturbing um, scenario of a possible alien invasion and, the, and like a military response. It's... It's interesting, incidentally, this, this thought came to me while I was watching Close Encounters last night. What struck me about Close Encounters is it is, it is very, it's very optimistic and positive. It's, I think this is, it's, it's why it inspired so many people. Not only are the aliens themselves benign, but they're dealing with a human society which itself is is very benign. I mean, they, they reach out to ordinary people, like, for example, uh, Ray, who is the, uh, the the main character, played by Richard Dreyfus. He's one of the principal main characters. And, of course, he's a very ordinary guy. He's a family man. He's working class. He's an electrician, works for a, a local power company, things like that. Um, and uh, he's... It's it's kind of like there is a conspiracy, of course, involving um, uh, Lafont, that's the uh, the French guy, and his translator, and all the other people from the United Nations. But it's a very it's a rather benign conspiracy, you know. It's the kind of um, it, it's got it's based around the UN, of course, who are portrayed as you know wanting to be nice to the aliens and meet the aliens on equal terms underneath the shadow of the Devil's Tower Mountain. And um, there's a kind of a, you know, there's there's a kind of a, um, there's a sweetness to it all. I think that's what stays with me. And I, I re-watched Close Encounters last night. So I'm um, seeing as I've got, got all the time in the world at the moment. I re-watched Close Encounters and it's, it's occurred to me. It's actually, it's very, it's moving actually. It's a very moving thing to watch. Because it's it's about a world which is essentially kind and peaceful, including the human world. I mean, um, 
it's it's like the the UN. Uh, there was a kind of secrecy about the UN operation dealing with the aliens, but it's it's not it's not there's not there's no malevolent intent behind it. It's just basically for the sake of safety and because they care about the people, they want to make peaceful contact with these aliens. You know, and it's, it's it, I think it goes with the fact when they capture these witnesses because the aliens, of course, are reaching out to certain people telepathically, including Ray and this this woman who. Whose son, his little three-year-old baby son, who's you remember the little toddler who runs out into the field and is capped, and then later on the, the aliens come and drag him out through the cat flap. You know she she's her she wants to get her kid back. There's this sense that and when they capture these people, they put them in a you know they put them on a helicopter, they give them gas masks because they, they've got this fake story about dangerous gas which is how they get people out of the way and then they put them on a they put them in a helicopter and they say well, okay we'll put them on the helicopter and we'll fly them out they shouldn't be here so we're going to put them on a helicopter and we're going to fly them out yeah. and some of them escape well three of them do Ray this lady who has name I cannot remember the mother of um, the little boy the little toddler and one other guy and and the government says oh my god they've escaped well it's time to get tough yes yes we're going to fly the helicopters over there and we're going to dust them with sleeping gas well, you may call it extreme if you like. You may call it extreme, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to knock them out, and in the morning they'll have a little bit of a headache. Yes, yes, we will. <laughs> it's like, oh dear, it's like this. The, the government are just so nice, aren't they? They're just so, <laughs> they're just so caring. You know, we used it on we used it on the livestock, you know, to, to make the horses and sheep and things go to sleep to, to, for the effect, and we can use it on these people. We don't want to, but we have to. We have to. We have to be. We have to be cruel to be kind and things like that. Oh, it's just so. It's all so. Na it's naive. It's very naive. I mean, I love it. It's a wonderful piece of escapism, and and there, of course, there are. That film is still a brilliant film, and it's it's the you know, Spielberg did his homework with this. He based it on real ufology. He had J. Allen Hynek, the real J. Allen Hynek, as a, as a consultant. And Hynek appears in one of the shots, actually, in the final scene where the mothership comes down. It's He knew what he was doing. It's a very well-made film, very well-written, put together. But it is naive. And that, there's, in Project Blue Book, there is none of that naivety. The, it, is, it is hearted in the gut. The government are portrayed as murderous, ruthless, selfish, and with no desire to protect the population at all. It's, they're portrayed as a very malevolent force, which is, do, does what it does, what does what it does for its own purposes, for the preservation of its own power, for the sake of greed and um, and control. And that, unfortunately, is a far more realistic portrayal. Of state actors than you get in Close Encounters, but it's there's no doubt that you know, Close Encounters has inspired the producers of Project Blue Book in the same way as it has almost every UFO, almost every UFO film made since. And I was watching, I watched Paul as well, which is a comedy um, about an alien, um, and it's it's very good actually. It's a, <clears throat> it's a British film that takes a piss out the Americans a bit, and there's this wise cracking alien. And, these two tourists, these two guys who go to like a tourist on a tourist tour of the UFO hotspots, they meet a real alien. <laughs> um, I didn't like it when I first saw the film in the cinema. I thought it was rather insipid and um, taking the Mickey a little bit. But it's grown on me. But that's inspired by Close Encounters as well. But I'm going off on a tangent now. Let's get back to Project Blue Book, guys. Let's get back to Project Blue Book. Anyway, um, where was I? Yes, um, the Psychic Laboratory, Green Glaze. And it turns out that <laughs> then Heinick goes to this circus and he finds out there's like a, a circus being run by Jimmy J. Shoemaker, the, the guy who reported the aliens. And um, it's a bit of a stupid circus. They've got a, they've got a zebra, which is actually a donkey painted black and white. <laughs> yeah, uh, things like that. And um, They've got monkeys as well. Now, uh, this is the thing, and uh, there's costumes for the monkeys. And then, of course, Heineck is starting to put two and two together. That uh, Jimmy J actually wanted publicity for the circus, and he made up the story about aliens, and he actually got these monkeys, these which can be trained, to pr basically act as aliens, so he could scare the hell out of his family and local people. And it's a little, basically a little bit of viral marketing for the... 
for the uh, for the circus. Indeed, uh, Mimi, see Mimi and her friend Evan from the UFO group, they they travel themselves to Hopkinsville. They meet this guy running a petrol station. He says, I'll "Tell you about Jimmy J. Shoemaker. If his lips are moving, that means he's lying." Indicating he's not generally regarded as an honest person in the local area. And Heinick, of course, then confronts him. <coughs> And this is rather like a bit like the Roswell case, because you get the feeling there's some kind of double bluff going on. Like the, the end of the Roswell episode, episode two. Because um, Jimmy J then says, yes, he's planning a recreation of the alien attack on his house. But the alien attack was real. And that's something left open. And indeed, I, I've never believed the, the sceptic line when it comes to the, the story of... The, the story of uh, the owls and things like that, and the fact that people claim to accuse the, the family of making it all up. Um, this is what the likes of Dunning, Joe, Brian Dunning and people like that have said. The sceptics. That it was just owls or that the family made it all up. According to the police report, the family were really scared. They, were, they saw real things they couldn't explain and they were really scared. Anyway, the, the Heineck is just in the middle of confronting this, and he believes he's closed the case. But then, what do you see? You see, like, um, you see, like, a huge number of trucks arriving from the uh, from the CIA or from the army and something. And then, um, Heineck and um, Quinn go and follow them, and they come to a hangar. Inside the hangar are flying saucers, but they they're they're, they're man-made aircraft. And indeed, uh, then the Heineck and Quinn are arrested by the military police guarding the these alien reproduction vehicles. And then, uh, then in General Harding comes to them and explains they're not alien reproduction vehicles; they're just devices. They're just reconnaissance devices. They're designed to fly and float like balloons and things like that. Uh, but they look to me like ARVs, alien reproduction vehicles. That's something that's left open. I mean, the whole idea that the whole Hopkinsville case was concocted, concocted by this circus guy, that's left open as well. Because he protests his innocence, even though Heineck now says he's closing the case. Indeed, he says to Harding at that moment that he believes he's closed the case. And of course, all Harding wants is for cases to be closed and reports to be written. That's the whole reason he and Valentine set up Project Blue Book. Allegedly, it's to investigate UFOs, but really, it's just so the government can close cases, write reports, and tell everyone these things don't exist. Which is what frustrated the real J. Allen Hynek, which is why he kind of went freelance and wrote his own book about UFOs. Anyway, um, Susie then now has survived her execution, uh, which is something I thought might happen, actually, when they gave her a glancing blow with a shovel, and you never see them filling in the grave. Um... She then confronts this KGB godmother who's been, like, who's the woman who tried to kill her, and does a deal. She, um, she tells this lady that she must protect her child, because this lady said that after Susie was dead they would recruit this young girl when she was old enough. Susie says, don't you dare as if to say, well, I'm going to come back and haunt you if you do that. But then, um... Susie tells this godmother, this KGB godmother or matriarch or whatever she is, um, that she will, she must protect her daughter. In return, Susie will kill a double agent, a guy who was a, who was a former Soviet agent now working for the Americans. And they did, you know. I mean, the the Russians, the Soviets were far more ruthless in the Cold War than the the West. For example, no retaliatory strikes were ever carried out against George Blake or the Cambridge spies or any other defectors. These guys could basically live normal lives wandering around Moscow, to th going to theatres and restaurants, living far better than the average Rus Russian did in those days. You know, uh, George Blake, as I explained in the film, he had this lovely little dacha, this country house given to him by a lake, and indeed he still lives there today, at the uh, grand old age of 98 or whatever he is. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, no one ever tried to kill him, but I mean, de Soviet defectors to the West were basically, a lot, had to live their lives under house arrest, effectively. They couldn't even go out of the house without a bodyguard. They had to live in safe houses. They had to watch their back wherever they went. They had to be armed because the KGB would hunt them down and kill them. And they did. They succeeded in a few cases. And most famously in 1940 with Leon Trotsky, they tracked him down to his hideout in Mexico and put an axe, ice axe through his head. 
And then, um, what's interesting what happens next is that Dan, the CIA man, confronts Harding and Valentine over this Pentacle Memorandum. Now, he then reads out, because we've only ever seen the title of this thing, we don't know what it refers to yet, but then Dan reveals by reading it out that it specifically refers to the faking of an alien invasion, I can't remember the exact quote, to test local law enforcement and authorities, to, to test the reaction of the civilian population to the presence of aliens in the sky, things like that. For all the things that we suspect that the government have used these things for, that would do, would do for an alien, for an alien attack or any kind of false flag alien event. Very similar, incidentally, to what I suspect the government are doing with the coronavirus crisis. And Dan, essentially, this this memorandum we find out is actually proof that they do intend to stage an alien invasion using these fake UFOs, these fake flying saucers above Hopkinsville to try and do it, which to try and achieve that, which makes you wonder what the real source of the Hopkinsville incident is. Is, I mean, it's never revealed or even discussed in the episode, but you have to ask the question, was Jimmy J. Shoemaker and his family part of this operation? And he says, and Dan says to, the, to Harding and Valentine, you know, do you want to prove yourselves in some way? Now, um, this is an indication of what came up in the last episode. There's some kind of rivalry between the CIA and the US Air Force. Indeed, uh, Dan's and Harding sort of know each other from the past because they used to be boxers. And he says, ah, remember what you were like in the ring, you were really tricky and things like that. And Harding goes, you want to try again, man? You want to try again, Dan? You know, this sort of thing. As if Harding is then challenging Dan to a fight. And this is symbolic of this internal civil war within the US government between the CIA and the US Air Force, which, are, which was talked about in the last episode, the Area 51 episode. But then Dan hints at blackmail. He says, basically, we were already fighting a war, a war this Cold War against the Soviets and the Communists, and, um, you know, you don't want any of this to get out. This kind of thing he threatens some kind of disclosure. Mm. And so you think that's the end of the whole thing, because Susie goes back to Quinn, um, I've got the feeling Susie's now becoming, is now effectively a renegade operating freelance in the same way that Quinn and Heineck is, which makes you wonder where this is going to go. Um, because, of course, the KGB have a death sentence on her, which she's won a stay off because of her deal she's done with this handler. But then something weird happens at the end. Heineck goes home, and a guy shows up, and the guy's Mr. Fixer. He's the kind of Man in Black-like character from the previous series, from Season 1. You remember, at the end of the last of Season 1, you see Fixer in Antarctica looking at this weird glowing alien obelisk that's, that's in Antarctica. And he comes back. Now, he's very different, though. He's not like the, the benign kind of... You get the feeling he's some kind of white hat Man in Black at the end of Season 1. But he's very different this time. He, th he turns up in Heineck's house house and Heineck and he pistol whips him and says oh professor and Heineck goes you and he says yeah and he pistol whips him so he's not this kind of like a but he's not this, this kind of like a gentle sweet character he was in the first season so and that's where it ends it ends on a cliffhanger so what's going to happen next can't wait to find out anyway the good news is um, I've got plenty of time so I can go and watch it and I'm, I don't have uh, to go to work so uh, for the next few days so I won't have to wait long to find out and neither will you her Panwo TV viewers thank you for watching this my review of episode 4 of season 2 of Project Blue Book watch this space because there's more coming very soon hospital port of pride and dignity stop the new world order